We now turn our attention after the medieval crisis to the Italian Renaissance and more importantly, the Renaissance in general. The word Renaissance literally means a rebirth, a rejuvenation of the ideas of ancient Greece and of ancient Rome. And when we look at where it begins, in a lot of ways, it's not surprising it occurs in the 1400s or in the 1500s in Italy and in Southern Europe. And we'll talk about more of that in a second. Now, the Renaissance is a term that is given to this period from roughly 1350, 1400, up until about 1600 or so, retrospectively, right? No one living in Europe in the uh, in this period would have you know known that a Renaissance was occurring. The you know the things that we think about in terms of the Renaissance, the great artwork, the the, the literature was only really accessible to a very small percentage of the population. And as a result of that, the wider groups of people would not have had the ability to see all of those things. So when we talk about the Renaissance, it's important for us to be aware it's not a broad thing that everybody has access to. Only a small segment of the population does. So today we're going to look at what was the Renaissance, why it starts in Italy and spreads outside of it, and then the political and social uh, implications that emerge from it. So let us begin. As I said a moment ago, the Italian Renaissance begins, as the name would suggest, in Italy. And the Renaissance starts predominantly in central Italy, central northern Italy, right? Places like the Papal States, Florence, Venice, uh, and the like. Why? In our previous conversation, we looked at um, we looked at trade routes and how trade was coming into Eastern um, um, how it was coming into the Eastern portion of the Mediterranean at this time. So trade is coming into the East, right? From those trade routes that we looked at previously, when we saw you know in that Mongol territory. Uh, coming from Asia, right? And the products that they're bringing are things such as pepper and spices and silks and and all of these luxury items that are very much in demand. And they're coming into Constantinople and then from Constantinople through Genoese from Genoa or Venetian or other traders coming into these northern Italian cities. They can then trade into France from Genoa or north into the Holy Roman Empire and what will become Germany from Venice. And this is becoming extremely wealthy, such, such that these merchants in Venice and in Genoa can sell pepper and other spices, nutmeg and cinnamon, for some, sometimes as much as 17 times what they paid for it. So we're talking just fabulous amounts of wealth. And as a result of that, one of the things that is going to happen is you're going to have wealthy merchants who are going to want to put their names on buildings in order to show off how fabulously wealthy they've become. And we call these people the Renaissance patrons. These are wealthy Europeans who have become very, very rich off of the back of this trade. And they are now going to turn that money into, into buildings and artworks and things for other people. Right. Again, you know, I, I said a moment ago that, you know, the artwork is not necessarily accessible to all people. And that's broadly true. Right. But, you know, there are sculptures that are put into town squares and beautiful churches that at least people can see the exterior of. So it's something that people are going to have access to. One other piece to this is that. Italy is fragmented. Italy, and I keep saying Italy, but the Italian peninsula is not unified in the way that we think of it today. It's not, you know, one government based in Rome. It's many governments based in local cities. So each city has a has a has a its own trade ports and its own industries. Each of these city states are competing with other city-states. So this is an area that is ripe for trying to show off your wealth. There's also a cultural phenomenon that is going on here 
And that is the form of humanism. Humanism is this idea of um, learning how to be a good human, how to be a uh, more full, fully developed individual. Now, most of the time this meant men, but you, but this meant that people should be able to learn to read, write, and speak well. Humanism gives us the free, gives us the root to the word the humanities, right? Subjects that still teach us how to read, write, and speak well. The first universities are founded in Italy at this time, and they are teaching subjects like Roman law or civil law, not church law. They're teaching literature. They're teaching history. They're reading their ancient texts. And you have the emergence, oops, sorry, you have the emergence of universities in the 10 hundreds, the first university being the University of Bologna um, in 1088. Universities are meant to train young men to take over other roles in society, to be, to be bankers and to be lawyers and be doctors and be teachers, educators, scholars. Um, so they're training these, these sort of next era of leadership and they're, the word university, universitas, which comes from Latin, is given to us from sort of the idea of a guild. Uh, there are different titles being earned. And you can see that here in the University of Glasgow charter. So the University of Glasgow is founded in 1451 by a declaration by the Pope, Pope Nicholas V. And in it, you can see his desire, or, or at least what he's writing here, is this goal to try and expand education broader than, um, you know, sort of some, you know, small groups of people, and to really sort of have people understand society, to understand nature and, and the world better. So you can see, um, it says here, uh, you know, um, Education is a gift from God to help understand the mysteries of the universe, to live well and to live happily, right? Again, to, you know, the education is key to our, to our success as, as humans. Even further down, right, you know, he talks about, um, you know, education is a way that will help to produce men distinguished for their ripeness and their judgments, crowned with the ornaments of virtue and erudite with the dignities of various faculties, and that there may be overflowing fountains of science out of whose fullness uh, all of the desires imbued and the lessons of knowledge may be may drink. Right again, this idea that education is a benefit to, to the person who receives it. One final piece here, and this will be helpful here, I guess, about why the Renaissance starts in Italy is Italian ruins, right? For those of you who maybe have been to Italy or been to Europe before, there's ancient Roman architecture all over because of the Roman Empire's wide spans. You have these, you know, Roman aqueducts and you have Colosseums and you have arches all over. So people are seeing these ancient Roman and uh, these Roman structures, and they're sort of thinking back to the to the old era. So you have all of this helping to inspire the Renaissance uh, when it emerges in the 13 and 14 hundreds. There are some major figures. One person who is, well, two people who are important. One is Francesco Petrarch. So Petrarch is the father of humanism. He um, is the first person to really introduce classical teaching into Europe and into Italy in the 1300s. And he, you know, is encouraging people to read the ancient texts. The person who is kind of most important to our look today is Giovanni Boccaccio. Boccaccio wrote in an Italian dialect. He was from Florence, and he is living in a world that was ravaged by the great, uh, by the Black Plague, right? If the Black Plague hits Europe in 1347, he's only 16 at the time. So he writes that account we looked at 
when he's quite young and he's discussing the sort of traumatic experience that he had and others had. And, you know, in his famous book, The Decameron, right, he's showing us the sort of experience that he had as a young man and the sort of questioning of, you know, did God send this pestilence to us? Uh, he writes in a very classical style uh, in order to try and do that. You have people like Mach Ma uh, Niccolo Machiavelli. If you've ever heard of somebody being called a Machiavellian character, um, that comes from here, right? So Machiavelli is famous for having said the phrase or written the phrase, the ends justify the means, right? How you, you know, uh, where you end up, your goal justifies how you get there, right? So if your goal is to become a great leader, but you need to do some surreptitious things to get there, that's okay as long as you achieve your goal. He worked in Florence when the Medici family, that, that family I uh, mentioned, uh, looked at earlier, uh, was out of power. And he come when he's tortured when they leave, and he writes a book called The Prince, and it's published, um, it's published in 1513, and it discusses sort of what it means to be a good leader, what it means to be uh, a thoughtful leader. And he says a good leader must be feared more than loved must be knowledgeable in the art of war, but also must have some compassion. So he's really, you know, one of the first true political scientists. Finally, the last piece I want to look at here is artwork. One of the big changes in artwork comes in its perception of the human body, and in particular, this idea of individualism. If you look at these images that I have of the Middle Ages art or the Dark Ages art, you're looking at artwork that is very one-dimensional. It's not, you know, it is not meant to sort of, you know, pop out of the wall. People are standing in unnatural positions. It's very religiously focused. And, you know, everybody sort of has the same facial structure, their body shape. But when the Renaissance comes, you have a fundamental change in that. We now start to look at individuals as individuals. Bodies change. You know, one of my favorite pieces of art is this one, where you really just see anguish. You see musculature. You know, it, it, there's, a, there's a huge change in the way that people are depicted, really focusing on what it looks like to be human and what it looks like to be an individual. Now, the person who is probably the, the most characterized figure of the Renaissance is Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci, we often call the sort of perfect example of a Renaissance man. He starts his career as, a, as, a, as a, an engineer inventing uh, military devices for the Medici family. But then he moves into artwork, uh, sculpting, and really does, really does it all, uh, literature. So the, one, some of his famous pictures, right? The Last Supper, painted in Milan. Um, the Mona Lisa, obviously. But then there are others. Uh, you know, his, he has you know, scientific drawings. The Vitruvian Man, he designs uh, an early helicopter. So again, you have this change in, in style. So the Renaissance, right, is a period where focus has changed. People start to look more at the individual and what is good for them to sort of benefit all of society. And that's where humanism comes along. Um, you know, humanism is this idea of being able to become a more perfect human, to become a better steward of information, um, and to use that information wisely to, 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 to make people's lives better. Now, again, artwork is changing. It's taking on a more individualistic transition. People are illustrated to really show themselves, right? You know, again, another good example is the statue of David that was produced by Michelangelo and put into the, um, put into the uh, squares, in, into the square in Florence. Again, trying to focus on the individuality and, and what it means to be, you know, what, what it means to look like a human. Uh, you know, the Sistine Chapel, his famous painting on the on the roof of the Sistine Chapel, right? Again, individual bodies, things like that. 
the, the Renaissance then spreads uh, to the north. And one of the great implications, one of the great reasons for that comes in the 1450s with a guy named Johann Gutenberg. Johann Gutenberg uh, uh, refits the printing press to try and move, uh, to, to make reading more accessible. Uh, so we'll talk more about this in another video, but you could make hundreds of copies of a pamphlet very easy. Put a sheet of paper down on, on some block print, press it, and then you can print it, press it a hundred times. So it's very easy to move ideas. And again, we'll talk more about that when we look at another, uh, another video. The last piece I want to point out here are two other examples of Renaissance uh, figures. One such person is a guy named Desiderius Erasmus and Thomas More. Erasmus was from the Netherlands, well, you know, from uh, what you know, from the Dutch, the Dutch states, and he's probably one of the most famous scholars in Europe at the time. He moves around quite a bit, spends time in Paris, in London, uh, and he is becomes very good friends with Saint Thomas More, Sir Thomas More, who was a English politician and thinker. Um, Erasmus uses satire to make fun of society and uses satire to make fun of how society operates. He has some major influential work, his most important, which is of, of the, in the praise of folly, which is critical of, of politics and critical of society and religious intolerance and all those things. St. Tho uh, Thomas More or Sir Thomas More uh, writes a book called Utopia, where he describes the sort of ideal society, one that is um, not go governed by um, you know, evil politicians or politicians who, um, you know, put it themselves above their role. So anyway, these are the things that come out of the Renaissance. And again, many of these ideas will continue to spread throughout our semester together.